the most important part is the downswing. So you've got to play at it, but what you've got to do, number one, is make sure you don't push at it. And the important part for me is how do you manage those 30 seconds between two deliveries? The end result can't be, you know, uh, end of it all. It has to be the process. Right, let's just start with the grip and the stance. So grip, it's very simple. Uh, it's old school, very old school. So just put the bat down on the floor, pick it up. And that's roughly, roughly your, your grip. Uh, a lot of kids nowadays I see, they, they turn their wrist around, the top grip around a bit. What that happens, what happens with that is then you're kind of locked. You're very good on the onside, but then through the offside, you get a little bit locked with your top hand. So I'd say, turn it around a bit. Again, the other thing to look at is is your V, the top hand V, is in line with the outside edge and your bottom hand V is kind of between the splice and the outside edge, so roughly that's the script. Uh, ideally, both the hands together, somewhere in the middle of the handle. I've seen a lot of batters with a split grip. Uh, the only problem with that is you tend to use your bottom hand a lot more. It's very difficult to control, especially when you're playing bigger shots. Um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, someone like Bradman had a split grip, but then what helps with that split grip, it helps you to maneuver the bat a lot better. You have more control, but ideally speaking, both the hands together, somewhere in the middle of the handle, and that's the grip. As far as stance is concerned, as far as stance is concerned, generally you're, you take your leg stump guard or a middle stump depending on um, what your batting style is and what your game plan is. Uh, the big challenge is to find out the distance between your legs. So roughly speaking, shoulder width, but bottom line, the most important part is what makes you comfortable. If you're comfortable with that kind of a distance, it's fine. If it's more comfortable wider, it's fine. So what the bottom line is this, the wider your stance is more than your shoulder length. It'll give you a good solid base, but that will hinder your movement. You won't be able to move that well. If it's narrow, then obviously your mobility will increase, but then you don't have a strong base. So ideally speaking, somewhere in between shoulder width apart, strong base, uh, and, and that's your stance. So the other important thing is it is a side-on game. Cricket is a side-on game. So you try and be as side on as possible, but just make sure you're not overtly side on because end of the day, we've got two eyes. We need to look at the ball with both our eyes. So even though we are trying to be as side on as possible, but making sure we are not overtly side on and kind of a little open so we can see the ball with both our eyes and the ball running in with both our eyes. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of people who, who uh, have a little bit of an open stance. That's got to do with a couple of things, how much their front foot move, with it, does it go across or not, or if it's going too much across, so you have an open stance. But having said that, for a right-hand batter against a left-arm seamer coming over the wicket, it also makes sense to open up a bit so that you are in line with the bowler, not with the stumps. So in line with the bowler, left-arm seamer over the wicket, just to open up a little bit. And in the stance, where a lot of players do, batters do, is when they're asked to bend, they bend from their back. Right? And what happens when you bend from your back is your head falls over. It's very, very important that your head is straight because one, your eye line has got to be at the same uh, level because once your head falls, obviously your left eye is, is higher than your right eye, so you need to get that in level. Secondly, if your head falls over, head being furthest from the ground, and also the heaviest part of the body, wherever the head goes, the foot will follow. So if the head falls over, chances are you'll follow it with your front foot as well and then you'll be playing everything across. So it's very, very important to keep your head straight within the base and, and also when you ask to bend, you bend with your knees, not with your back. Because if you bend with your back, your head will fall. So when you ask to bend, bend with your knees. And that's predominantly it. Side on, but not overtly side on. Uh, generally the grip, the bottom hand V, splice or between the splice and the outside edge. Top hand V along uh, the outside edge. 
hands together, that's about it. That's with the grip, the stance, and uh, you know how much you need to uh, keep your feet apart and stuff like that. Trigger movement. Well, uh, trigger movement. There, most of the batters you'll see nowadays they have a trigger movement. But do I encourage a young kid, 11, 12 year old, starting to play the sport? Uh, I wouldn't encourage them to have a trigger movement because the whole idea of the trigger movement is, especially when you're playing against quick bowlers, you get your body into motion. So your body is, is ready to move when the ball is delivered. So obviously there are different kinds of trigger movements. One is obviously the front foot press, which is very common and especially used to be very common uh, uh, in the subcontinent. You still see a lot of subcontinental batters. They go like front foot press. The other is back and across then there's uh, there's something called the second stance where you actually walk right across uh, one of the best players to do that was obviously kevin peterson he would you know walk right across with both his feet so there are different uh, 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 different trigger movements but it boils down to what suits you what comes naturally to you uh, to get your body moving uh, to play the delivery so but the most important part is there a couple of things. One, that trigger movement has to kind of finish before the ball is delivered. Because if you're still moving after the ball is delivered, you're still in the process of finishing a trigger movement, you'll be too late to react to the ball. So for example, if you have a front foot press and you're late and that front foot press happens after the ball is delivered, when especially playing the quicker bowlers, you've got nowhere else to go. So more often than not, you're hurried and you play from where you are. So there is not much footwork because you don't have the time. Uh, the other important thing is trigger movement should be as small as possible because bigger the trigger movement, chances of you being late and your head falling over and other things happening will be more. So just make sure it's nice and small and, and subtle, not jerky movements, not big movements. And also making sure your head stays as still as possible because it's very, very important. Our eyes are like cameras. So if the camera is moving around, chances are the picture is not that clear. So even if it's front foot press or back and across, or a second stance or whatever it is, just make sure it's predominantly lower body, not much of the upper body. Because I've seen a lot of players, they actually, when they go across or, or whatever their trigger movement is, they go with their head. So making sure your head does not move or moves very, very little, most of that movement is from your lower body, is from your lower body. Uh, that's, these are the two very, very important things that you gotta keep in mind if you have a trigger movement. Make sure it's done before the ball is delivered, so you have the time to move after. And secondly, making sure your head doesn't move, it's predominantly a lower body, which gets your body into motion. Bad pickup. Well, um, you know, I'm not a big believer of the pickup. One of the, obviously, you want it to be as straight as possible, not very straight though, because the arc of the bat, it's, it's a funny thing, it's never straight up and straight down there'll be a bit of an arc so it goes wide and it comes from inside so if you think it's straight up and straight down it generally is not more often than not there is a little bit of an arc a little bit of a uh, uh, a circle which happens there so it goes up in a certain uh, uh, direction and it comes down from a little bit inside from there uh, so i'm not a big fan of how wide the pickup is it can be from here here but the most important part is the downswing. The upswing is still all right, is manageable, but if the downswing is, is as wide as that, then obviously that creates a bit of a gap between bat and pad, and you'll be more often than not onside player. And to play on the offside, you have to move your bat around and play through the offside. So the downswing is important. The downswing has to be straight. The upswing, yeah, it can be wide. It can be why that's not a problem, but make sure it's not too straight because if it's too straight, chances are the downswing would be from inside and then it's a problem to play deliveries which are straight or on the onside. Chances of leg before increases manifold. Uh, so that's that. The other thing in the pickup is that what we were told for, uh, for a very long time is a little bit of a uh, cocking of the wrist that helps to play horizontal bat shots, pull, but uh, if you don't cock your wrist, if it's really straight, 
you, it's very difficult to get your bat on top of the bounce. So if you cock your wrist, it, gets, it becomes easier to get on top of the bounce, whether you're playing a cut or a pull shot. So if it's possible, it's great. It's not mandatory. If, it, if you can't cock your wrist like that, it's fine. But you do a couple of things. Like I said, one, you, it, uh, it helps to get on top of the bounce. And secondly, you get more power as well. So you bend all your levers and then at the point of impact, all those levers, they straighten. So that will give it more force into that shot. So pickup wise, be careful with the downswing. Upswing is manageable, but downswing has to be straight down. Well, playing a quick bowler, well, there are quite a few things uh, that you got to keep in mind. Number one, obviously we spoke about the trigger movement. Just make sure that you finish with whatever trigger movement you have, whether it's front foot press or back and across, whatever it is, you finish before the ball is delivered. So it's very important in your mind, you practice the trigger movement as soon as you see your bowler because every bowler has a different action. Somebody would have a bigger jump, somebody wouldn't have a jump. So just make sure while you're there, the non-strikers and especially, you kind of figure that out when do you start with your trigger movement, making sure you finish it before the ball is delivered. The other important thing, especially against quick bowlers, when the bowler is running in, let's say the bowler has got a longish run up, 15, 20 yards. I've seen a lot of batters who start focusing as soon as the bowler starts running uh, from the top of his mark. Now what happens is our concentration span is very, very short. So once the bowler starts and you're 100% focusing on the ball, chances are by the time he reaches or he delivers, you're, you've lost your 100% 100% concentration. So for that, what you can do is, yes, you're there, you're ready for the bowler when he starts running, but you're not, let's say, 100%, you're like 95, 90%. But just before he reaches his delivery side, that's when, and you can kind of align it with your trigger movement that's when you get 100% ready that's when you're like you know you're absolutely ready to face the ball so a lot of players I've seen who get ready right at the top when the bowler is starting to run and what happens is get very eager to play the ball and starts moving his head a lot of actually players when you see their heads falling could be a technical thing or could be a mental thing when they get ready early or they they're focusing way too early and then they get very eager and their head starts falling over in in the eagerness to play the ball so yes you start focusing but not 100 percent you start absolutely 100 percent concentration in roughly when you're starting your trigger movement when the ball is somewhere near his delivery stride or at or in his rather delivery stride that's the uh, that's the second thing the third thing is i've seen a lot of players who are a little hesitant in deciding whether to go on the front foot or the back foot because, listen, any, anything too short, it's easy to decide. You pick it up early, right? Anything too full, again, you can see it. It's comparatively easier. It's that middle length, right? Six meter, seven meter length, the in-between length or the good length as we call it. That's where the hesitation happens. Now, this, would, this is what I would suggest is take a call early, whether it's front foot or back foot, you can make mistakes and you will make mistakes but if you're committed at least you don't you're not wasting time moving your legs so for example a ball which you could have played off the back foot but you already committed on the front foot it's easier to manage it with your hands from there rather than coming to your back foot or managing from that position again so you you definitely will be late there same with your back foot suddenly You've decided that you want to play it off the back foot, but you could have gone on to the front foot rather than again trying to adjust with the footwork, try and manage. So decide early, trust yourself, don't worry, your hands will do the rest of the job even if you've got the length wrong with your footwork. Picking up length. Uh, well, we keep talking about picking up length early. Now, how do you do that? There are different ways of doing it. One of the best way of doing it is obviously watching the release. Watch the release you get a lot of clues when you watch the release, watch the seam of uh, the ball, the release, when the ball's being released, whether it's an outswing, inswing, which side is the shine, uh, the bowler's action itself, if it's a little open chested, chances are it would be an inswinger, if it's more side on, it'll be an away swinger. So you get all these cues, so keep a very, very close eye on the release of the ball. Spinners, 
whether it's an off spinner, whether it's a straighter, a googly or a leg spin, you've got to, got to look at the release of the ball. Watch the seam. There are very, uh, there are quite a few drills uh, from that perspective that you can do to just to make sure you're looking at the release of the ball. And uh, the other important thing is, is just try and figure out roughly a box, a six by six inch box, where you think the ball will be released from. Keep a very, very close eye kind of that box because that's where the ball is coming from. A lot of uh, batters nowadays bat against uh, the, the, the bowling machine. Well, if you're doing that, obviously you're seeing that release point. So make sure when you're playing a bowler as well, you kind of have this box, somewhere imaginary box, where you think the ball is going to come out from. So those are the things uh, that you got to keep in mind in terms of picking up length early and adjusting if you have made a mistake, which you will, everyone does. Uh, then is the balance. Now, it's a very, very important thing. We keep hearing about it when the when you listen to commentary, he's got good balance or, you know, he needs to improve on his balance. Now, the whole idea of balance is making sure your head, which is the heaviest part of your body, is within the base. The moment your head goes outside the base, whether it's of the back foot or front foot, you will be disbalanced, right? So making sure that box that you've created with your legs, with your footwork, your head stays within that box. The moment it goes outside the box, offside, leg side, behind, wherever, chances are your legs will move. Uh, you know, it, it has to move to get your head back into that box. So the idea is making sure your head is inside that base. So that is for balance. And obviously what you also need to do is transfer of body weight. We keep talking about transfer of body weight. Now, the whole idea is you can keep your body weight behind and still play with your hands. But in this age of power, you need every bit of power possible when you're hitting a shot. So the idea is to get your body behind. So it's very important at the point of impact, your body weight goes in front if it's of the front foot. Back foot. A lot of people make this mistake of the back foot is the body weight, they take their body weight on the back foot. So moment your body weight completely goes on the back foot and especially on the heel, you'll always be under the ball. You can never get on top of the ball, right? So even though you're playing off the back foot, the intention is to keep your head in front. You still want your body flow to go in front, even though you're on the back foot. But the idea is to, to make sure your body weight is still going in front the moment your body weight goes behind and especially on the heel, you're in big trouble. You'll be in no position to play any shot. Then you're kind of fending or defending uh, and trying to protect yourself. So back foot, very important is to stay on the toe and making sure your head is always trying to go forward towards the shot, whether it's there or if it's you're cutting it, you're pulling it, you know, your, your head is always moving in front. Your body weight is always trying to move in front, even though you're trying to play a shot off the back foot. Playing spin, obviously that's that's a major thing, right? Uh, one of the most important things to play spin, again, apart from the fact that whatever your trigger movement is, and ideally speaking, very few players, they have a very exaggerated trigger movement for spin. So more often than not, it's, it's more like a front foot press. Front foot press, and that's about it. Very few people I've seen would go back and across to spin. So generally, if you have a trigger movement, if you want a trigger movement, stick with the front foot press with the spinners or against the spinners. Now, the most important part is to see the release of the spinner. It'll give you so many clues, obviously in terms of whether the ball's turning, it's not turning, it's a straighter one, whether it's a googly or a leg spin, release is imperative. So you have to have to pick up uh, which way the ball will turn or might turn more often than not from the release point, the seam position, again, is a great indicator of whether the ball's going to turn or not. For example, an off spinner, if the seam is straight up, chances are it's not going to turn, it's going to go on straight with the arm. If it's somewhere towards the fine leg, it will turn. Side spin, again, or undercut, if you can't see the seam nice and upright, 
chances are it'll fall on the leather part and it's going to skid through and it's not going to turn. So it's very, very important. The most important thing to play spin is to see the release and you'll get almost 80, 90%, if not 100% of the clues from the release point itself. Now, you've got to have one out of these two shots to be successful against spin. One, stepping out. Two, or the other option rather, is the sweep. Let's start with the stepping out thing. Uh, you know, attacking uh, the spinner because the chances, chances are if you don't use your feet, you're not stepping out or you're not sweeping, you're stuck and playing from the crease, you're gone. Very, very little chance. Now for stepping out, the most important part is obviously to see the trajectory. And now what we've been taught and it's, it's obviously is, is foolproof to a great extent is the trajectory if you see the ball actually going higher than the release point, then you know for sure it's a fuller delivery and it's slower, it has a bigger loop, you can reach it, you can use your feet. So practice that in the nets, try and see if the ball after releasing has it gone over and above the line of the release point. So if it's gone up, try and see that more often than not, it, you will be able to reach it by using your feet and get to the pitch of the ball. So that becomes very, very important. The other important thing is, again, spin. You try and play with the spin. If you figure out it's an off spinner and it's gonna turn, it's an off spin, then chances are or it'll be a, you'll be better off trying to play it with the turn towards the onside rather than trying to play against the turn, right? That's what the bowler would want you to do. The spinner would want you to play against the turn. Same with a leg spinner. If you see it's a leg spinner, Try not to play against the turn to, towards the onside. Try and play with the turn towards the offside, unless it's a googly, obviously. If you have to play against the turn, the best shot, horizontal back shot, right? So that, that, uh, that, uh, that's how we come to the second option, which is the sweep shot. And sweep shot is so dangerous because when do you sweep? You sweep, and which deliveries do you sweep? You sweep a good length delivery, right? So you go in front, and you sweep a good length delivery. So that makes it that much more painful for the bowler because the bowler's bowled a good ball. He's hit the right area, but he's still got for, gone for runs. Now, for the sweep, there are so many things, but the most important part is obviously picking up the line and the length. That goes without saying. And then uh, the other thing is I've seen a lot of batters who are body weight stays behind. So when the body weight stays behind, and as you can see, my head is behind right now, I will never get on top of, chances are I will not get on top of the bounce. I'll always get under the bounce. And secondly, I don't have my pads on, but when I have my pads, my hands will be here, somewhere here where the pads are. So they will be restricted. The bat flow will be restricted. Now, for me to have a good clean swing of the bat, I have to get my head over my front leg so I can reach the ball and have a free access to the ball with my hands, right? The moment my head is back, my hands, even though they are outstretched, will always be restricted with the pads and I'll be hitting under the ball, not over the ball. So if you're hitting in the air, a slog sweep, that's fine. Then you have to kind of keep your body weight back to get under the ball. But a good sweeper would have that ability to choose and play the shot that he would want to, whether it's slog, under or over. So for over, You've got to get your head on top of the ball or in front of your front leg, making sure the bat swing comes from up to down on top of the bounce so you can keep the ball along the ground and control your shot. Uh, for that, obviously, like I said, bat goes up and your head stays in front of the front leg so your hands have easy access to the ball. So these are things you can practice, these two shots. You can have drills, you can ask somebody to chuck balls and you can sweep. Uh, obviously, in the nets, you try and do that. In the nets, you try and see the trajectory and, 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 and use your feet and practice that. So these are things that you've got to do, at least one of them. If you have both, then you're a champion player against spin, for, without a question. Um, the other thing is, now, wrist spinners. There are a lot of wrist spinners and there, there might be days where you have not you're, or you're not picking the wrist spinner. You can't figure out the googly. For example, Rashid Khan is a great example. It's very difficult to pick his, his googly. So uh, one of the first things that you do is you try and play everything as an incoming delivery. 
because if you look at it, then you play percentage cricket. Now, what is percentage cricket? If you're playing everything that is coming into you, you're protecting your stumps, you're protecting leg before wicket, right? Uh, the only thing you still kind of might not be protecting yourself against would be the outside edge. Now, if you're playing for a leg spin or anything which is leaving you, then chances are you've exposed yourself to leg before, bold, and all uh, other sorts of uh, dismissal. So if you haven't or you're struggling to pick a bowler, a leg spinner or a wrist spinner particularly, you try and play for the ball coming into you rather than ball leaving you. Chances are if it'll turn and you're playing inside the line, you'll get beaten. Right? Now with the advent of DRS, you know, gone are the days where you could actually use your foot or your leg as a second uh, you know, uh, 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 a second source of protection or second uh, line of protection. It's all about bat. So it is very important nowadays to actually pick as much as possible from the release point, which side the ball might turn and try and play ahead of your pad, right? Ahead your, of your pad, but making sure your head is on top of the ball because the moment your head falls back and your body weight is somewhere in between or behind, chances are look at my bat face. Right? We want that bat face to be acute so that even if you don't hit it on the middle of the bat, because of the bat angle, it will not carry to silly point or short leg or slips for that matter. But the moment my body weight is back and my bat face is a lot straighter, then chances are they will carry. Right? So the idea is to get on top of the ball, keeping my bat angle acute as much as possible so that even though you don't hit it out of the middle, they don't carry. Right, the last and again a very, very important thing to play spin is you can't play spin from the crease. You can't have a small, uh, you know, stride forward or, or try and play from the crease. You can't do that. You can manage that against the quicker bowlers, but against spin, you've got to be very, very clear in what you want to do with your footwork. Either it's a good stride forward, try and reach there with your foot, the pitch of the ball, and smother the spin, or if you can't do that, making sure you use the depth of the crease. You can't possibly be caught playing from the crease because then you're gone. Against good spinners, on especially on tracks which are turning a bit, helping the spinners a bit, it'll be very difficult to manage from the crease. So either you've got to decide and be very clear in front or if the pitch is slow or, or, and the ball is bowling short, back foot. Back foot, another very, very important thing. You can't be... <laughs> In Bengali, we call it Jodapa. That means, off the back foot, you can't have both your feet together. That goes both for the quick bowlers and the spinners especially. The quick bowlers, you don't have enough time. But because with spinners, you have time. I've seen a lot of international players playing off the back foot with both their feet together. Because what happens is, when you, both your feet are together, you're stuck. You can't go anywhere. You can't maneuver. And especially I've seen a lot of people playing like that to off spinners and suppose a ball's turning back into you, you're stuck, you can't do anything. So it's very important for, especially against spinners, when you go on the back foot, you keep yourself an option, an exit policy, so to say, if the ball turns back into you, even though you're looking to play through the offside, but it comes back to you, you can quickly adjust. But the moment you've got both your feet together, you've got nowhere to go. So, Especially against spin, if you're playing off the back foot, just make sure you're a little open, you're not overtly side on, and you have space enough to adjust if it comes back into you. Power hitting, right? I mean, everyone's talking about power, hitting sixes, and how far you can hit. There have even been suggestions of, you know, if somebody hits a hundred yard six, it should be eight runs, not six. So it is a very, very essential part of cricket nowadays. So it's important that you get the technique right. It's not about just brute force. It is also about technique. One of the biggest mistakes that people make while, while power hitting is opening up the body too early. Because you want to hit very hard, chances are, and we keep talking of, about it on air, you must have heard a lot of times commentators talking about losing shape. Now, what exactly is losing shape? So the idea is, if you open up early, then you're only hitting with your bottom hand. So what happens, look at me, now what happens if I've, I've opened my front foot, obviously I want to access the ball, I want a free path for my bat, that is fine. But if my front shoulder also opens up, right, and I'm trying to hit straight, my shoulder's already gone there. So I'm not getting any power from the front part of my body, the front portion of my body. So all I'm doing is hitting with my bottom hand. 
So chances of you going wrong, trying to hit with an open body like that are massive. And chances are you will slice it. You see a lot of, lot of batters slicing it. It's because they open up early and they are just slicing it with their bottom hand. And, and that's a big issue. So the idea is to keep that shape intact. And when I say shape, is you don't open up your body. Even if you've opened up your front foot for the access, uh, uh, accessing the ball, but your upper body is still closed. The moment you open that up, you're in trouble. So keep that body closed. You know, it's, it's so much like baseball. You see in a baseball batter, they don't open up when they hit those uh, huge uh, home runs. They keep it nice and side on. So what happens is then you're using your front portion of the body, your core muscle, your core muscle is kind of now, uh, it's, it's coiled right now. And at the point of impact, it opens up and it uncoils. So you're using your front portion of the body, your core, and obviously your bottom hand as well, and the, the, uh, the back side of your body or, or, or the, the latter part of your body into the shot as well. So just make sure when you're practicing power hitting, you're not opening up too early, you're closed, your upper body is specially side on, and only at the point of impact will it open up for your bottom hand and your, your, your back foot to come through or uh, you know so you get more power so just make sure that you keep that shape going as I said even though your front foot opens up and goes towards the leg side your upper body is still closed it doesn't open with that front foot and if you really really want to hit hard just make sure your front foot as well it doesn't open up like that if you want to hit it straight, that is, not on the, uh, not behind square. If you're planning to hit cow's corner, mid on, mid off, or long on, long off, you keep it closed, so your hips are closed as well. So the moment this goes up, out, your front toe, your hips open as well, they tend to open. It'll be very difficult to keep your hips closed with a toe opening like that. So if you can, keep it closed, so your hips are closed, you're still side on, and then at the point of impact, obviously you go. Again, baseball, golf. Have you seen a golfer trying to hit a long, long drive, opening up a foot like that? No, they don't. They keep it shut because they want to coil, uh, coil the core and then uncoil at the point of impact, right? So that's what happens. They want to keep it side on and, and get as much power and as much body behind the shot as possible. So the most important thing for power hitting is not losing your shape, as I mentioned, keeping it for as long as possible and then kind of unraveling it or uncoiling it at the point of impact. Ever wondered what these cricketing terms mean? I enlisted the help of former Indian cricketer Deep Dasgupta to explain from a batting perspective. Well, cross bat is something obviously where we trust our basic natural instincts and go across the line. We get to see that very often nowadays in, uh, you know, T10s, T20, the shortest format of the game where a lot of batters, they play across the line. This swing comes naturally to us and if you look at the big sixes, more often than not, if you look at those wagon wheels, you'll see those would be square leg or mid wicket, which is your cross bat shot. So, yeah, one thing, you've got to still play it because obviously we're talking about strike rates here, scoring quick runs, but you've got to make sure that obviously the point of impact, your body weight, you know, your, your, you don't open up. You must have heard of the term hold your shape and the holding your shape is all about making sure you don't open up early. The moment you open up early, your front portion of the body is, you, you take that away from the game. So if everything then depends on the, the, the other half, right? The right hand side for a right hander. So you open up the, uh, the front shoulder, you lose your shape and then you, you lose a lot of power and then more often than not, you start slicing as well. So you got to make sure when you're playing cross bat shot, ideally speaking, you maybe avoid it as much as possible. But if you are, then make sure you hold on to your shape for longer and then you get power. And secondly, the timing as well. Chin music, well, that was a term very, very common back in the 80s and 70s where you could bowl as many bounces as possible. And talking about bounces, you might have guessed what am I talking about. When I said chin music, it is basically bowling bounces to the batters. So chin music, so most of the deliveries are going past your chin, past your head. And that's what chin music is all about. So obviously, earlier on, before 
90s and all, where there wasn't restriction on the number of bounces you could have bowled in an over, uh, that was very common. Remember uh, the West Indian bowlers, if you've heard of them? God, yeah, that was actual chin music. You still get to see some of it, especially when you're playing in South Africa, Australia, not as much in the subcontinent or even England because those pitches don't have as much bounce. But yes, Australia and South Africa, you still, and New Zealand to a great extent, you still get to hear, and especially certain uh, venues like Perth and all, or Gabba, as in Brisbane, you see a lot of bounce. That's where you see a lot of batters bowling short pitch and making sure the batsman's kind of, you know, on the back foot, pinned on the back foot more often than not. That's what chin music is all about. And if, as a batter, if that's what the bowler is trying to do, obviously there are few options that you've got is letting it go. Make sure that when you're letting the ball go, you're watching the ball till the last moment. You don't take your eyes off. I know you've got your chest pad, your helmet, your arm guard and everything else. But even then, just make sure you're watching the ball, watching the ball till the ball has gone past you. A lot of batters, you'll see they go head down, take your eyes off. Never ever do that, right? So that is the most important part. No matter what the ball ball is trying to do, you always keep watching the ball. Then the other option is obviously the pull shot. Very rarely you get to see hook nowadays. Hook would be anything which is over your shoulder. Predominantly it's pull shot. So a very, very important aspect of pull shot is obviously you pick the right line and right length. But a lot of batters nowadays are pulling off the front foot. So keeping that in mind, just make sure your body weight is always going forward. Even though you kind of, I've seen a lot of batters, they're pulling off the front foot, but their body weight stays back. The moment your body weight stays back, your bat goes down and the bat swing is from bottom to up. So the chances are you'll be hitting it in the air and more often than not, you're not in control. So if you want to be a good puller, the most important part is your body weight, no matter whether you're hitting off the back foot or the front foot, your body weight has to be in front so you can get on top of the bounce. In top of the bounce, you can control it, you can keep it along the ground, you can hit it in the air so you can do whatever you want to. Yes, at times you might get beaten by pace and you might have to adjust. Then also try and adjust with your arm, right? In terms of either a full stretch arm or a short arm jab as we call it, but try and avoid to take that body weight off your front foot and onto the back foot. Just make sure it's on the front foot and you're top of the bounce. Corridor of uncertainty. Well, that's the area, the line we're talking about predominantly here where the batter is kind of confused whether you're going to play at it or you're going to let it know. And what is that line? That line is around off stump to fourth or the fifth stump. As you can see this roughly with these cones, I've tried to kind of uh, indicate what the corridor of uncertainty would mean. And as a batter, and why is it called the corridor of uncertainty? Obviously, you can see that corridor there. And uncertainty because you don't know whether you want to play at it or you want to let it go. Because a lot of the bowlers, they go wide of the crease, the angle brings them in. Even if they bowl around fifth stump, that angle, you want to play at the angle, right? So you really don't know what you're going to do. So that's the reason it's called the corridor of uncertainty. And as a batter, what you need to do is just make sure you play the line first, right? For example, like I said, you'll find a lot of away uh, swinging bowlers who actually go wide of the crease. At this point in time, the best example of it is Jimmy Anderson. If you see, he goes wide of the crease and he gets the ball to swing from that corridor. And because of that angle, you're sucked into it. So you would have to. You can't let that go because if it doesn't swing, the angle will make sure it go, goes and hits the stump. So you've got to play at it. But what you've got to do, number one, is make sure you don't push at it. Because the moment you push at it, you're exposing your outside edge. So you're covering the angle by trying to play the angle, which is the first line. Make sure your bat is within yourself, your body, right? It's not pushed out. And the second and the most important thing is pray that you don't edge it. And if you still manage to edge it without kind of poking your bat outside your body, well, you've got to uh, doff your hat to the, bo to the bowler and say, well, bowl. Because at times, those deliveries, you really can't do much. So. That's the corridor of uncertainty. Always try and play the angle is what I'd say, what I'd suggest. If it's leaving you and it beats you, beats your outside edge, good luck. Across the line, right. So what we talk about line, that would be line of the stumps. So you see the stumps, that's the line of the stumps. And it's very self-explanatory what across the line would mean. Across the line would mean that 
line of the stumps, anything, any ball, from the line of the stumps, you kind of whip it on the outside. So you're playing across the line, all right? So playing across the line. So it's kind of self-explanatory. So a lot of batters actually, you'd see a lot of batters, when, especially when their heads are falling, they can't help it, they're, they're stuck, they go across, right? And they get stuck there, and especially against in-swing bowlers, and they kind of try and play across the line, and they get out leg before bowled quite a few times. But in modern day and contemporary cricket, a lot of batters, good, and I'm talking about, when I'm saying good, I'm talking about greats here, let's say a Virat Kohli, a Joe Root, a Steve Smith, they are very dominant bottom hand. So if you have a dominant bottom hand, you would want to whip it because your onside would be your strength, right? And because of that, bottom strong bottom hand, your onside game is strong. So you would want to whip it across the line. Anything straight, we've seen, for example, Virat, even he whips it on the onside balls which are pitched on off, off stump or even outside off stump. But if you're doing that and your strength is that, I'm not going to suggest, I'm not going to suggest don't play that shot, but you've got to make sure your head is still two things. On top of the ball, not falling over, that's one. Secondly, your head in front of your front foot. So you're playing off across the line, but in front of your front foot. The moment you get stuck behind, then obviously chances are, if you don't time it, if you're late or early, you're going to get out it's going to come and hit your stumps or your pad. So, if you want to play across the line, which is fine, and especially bottom-handed, bottom-dominant batters, make sure your head's not falling over, that's one. And secondly, your head's in front of your front foot, so you can meet the ball in front of the pads. And you see a lot of batters do that with the DRS, because you anyways don't want to hit uh, the ball to hit your pads, you want to play it in front of your pads. So please, if you're playing across the line, I would suggest two things, head, not falling, uh, falling over, and head in front of your front foot so you can meet the ball in front of your front foot. Well, in cricketing parlance, when we're talking about fishing, we're not talking about the whole team going on a fishing expedition. So we're talking about when the batter, predominantly because of indecision, is playing away from the body, poking at the ball, and like I said, it happens primarily because of indecision. So you've your foot goes onto the first line and suddenly you see the ball moving or, or leaving you, you poke at it. You try and reach for the ball with your hands, with your body not going anywhere, your head not going anywhere. And especially it happens outside off stump, away going balls or balls which are straightened after, you know, kind of coming in with the angle. You see a lot of batters going in there and then playing away from your body, right? Playing away from their body, trying to reach the ball or play the ball only with their hands. And more often than not, that leads to either the batter getting beaten or getting that outside edge. So, yeah, that, like I said, pr primarily happens because of a lot of indecision. For example, you don't know whether you should be playing off the front or the back. Foot doesn't go anywhere, but you can see the ball and then you want to play the ball with your hands. And that uh, is the reason where, you know, a lot of the batters, they get out. And they kind of look bad as well when you keep fishing. Uh, so to avoid that, obviously what you want to do is trust yourself. Yes, your decision making will not be 100% most of the times. You will make mistakes. You will, you know, whether it, um, in, in terms of the length or the line, but you've got to trust yourself. For example, if a fuller delivery, you've got onto the front, you've decided to go off the, onto the back foot, I would say don't go, but try and manage from there. Trust yourself, right? Same, if it's a short ball, you already committed yourself onto the front foot. Trust yourself, your body or your hands or your eyes will make sure you will be fine. And as we keep saying, try and play inside the box. So the box would be where my body is. So outside edge of my foot to my heel and the sides. So that's the box. If you can, obviously when you're taking that stride forward, that box increases, try and get that bat, keep that bat inside the box. The moment your hands go outside the box, you don't have much control over your hand or your back. So as long as you're playing inside your body, inside that box, you should be all right. You won't go fishing for sure. Quite a few really weird terms that we use in cricket, and one of them is cow's corner. Well, I don't know how this term came about in cricket, but I'm sure it's, it's more than 100 odd years. It actually is a field position, a part of the field. So we've got long on, right, which is a very traditional orthodox field position, long on. 
and mid wicket or deep mid wicket but what about the area between those two and th initially when first i started at least playing cricket cow's corner was kind of a derogatory term so you know you basically you if you want to reach that area between the long on and the mid wicket which is the cow's corner the only shot or primarily the shot that would help you access that area was that slog so it was frowned upon obviously you know playing across and slogging it so a lot of these terms are kind of interrelated right slogging cow's corner and which was frowned upon but obviously uh, with t20 and even t10 and 100 a lot of players actually find it very very useful that's a very productive area of the field the cow's corner which absolutely coincides with your natural batting swing for a right-hander, for me, it would be there. Obviously, for a left-hander, it's the other side. But because it's such a productive area, so which was a position, a shot, or whatever, which was frowned upon earlier on, it is kind of more traditional, or it's kind of mainstream now to a great extent, the, the cow's corner position, which is between long on and deep mid wicket. And a lot of, like I said, a lot of batters, it's been very, very productive, that area. The, Predominantly, you see a lot of flicks, which is still fine. You kind of chip it or you flick it over, you step out. But more often than not, you're hitting across the line. So, so you see a lot of batters hitting across the line. Again, something which was frowned upon earlier on. But, well, it's a mainstream. It's, it's one of the main shots nowadays. Good length. As the name suggests, any length, which obviously creates a lot of issues for the batters, a lot of problems or tough questions for the batters. That's a good length. Now, obviously, good length would be different for different batters. If I'm a front foot player, the good length would be a little on the shorter side. If I'm a back foot flare, uh, player, the good length would be a little fuller. So that would also depend a lot on the conditions. If it's a slower pitch, the good length would be a little fuller. If it's a quicker pitch, it would be further back that length. But predominantly, before anything else, whether before you know well who the batter is or how he or she plays, what the conditions are going to be, how the pitch is going to behave, the best way to figure out the good length is the length which hit top of off. The length which hit the top of off is where you start off with your good length. So ideally speaking, why is it called a good length? A good length is because that in between length where a batter does not know whether I should go on the front foot or play off the back foot. So somewhere around that six meter mark. So it would be somewhere here. If I'm batting here, so it would be somewhere where that first ball is, where I really don't know whether I should. In fact, it could go further back. So whether I should go in front or should I go play it off the back foot. So I'm a little confused. So that is what a good length is. But like I said, to start off with, when you don't know what the batter is, whether it's good off the f back foot or front foot, the benchmark or the starting point is the length and the line that hits top of off. As a batter, again, the most important part is that is a good length because, as I mentioned, as a batter, it's very difficult to figure out or to kind of decide whether you want to play it off the front of or, or off the back foot. What I would suggest is trust yourself, decide, quickly whether you want to go on the front foot or back foot and then play it without second guessing yourself there'll be times you're playing the same length of the back foot next time you'll be playing off the front foot but trust yourself trust your judgment back yourself and your instincts and don't second guess yourself well, on the up, you see a lot of these shots being played on really good batting surfaces where you just plant your foot again, hit through the line. And why do we say on the up? Because ideally speaking, when we're talking about playing off the front foot, what length are we talking about being the driving length where the ball's fuller, it's under your bat and you can drive. But on the up or on the rise as well, we call it, is when the ball's pitched a little shorter but you still go on to the front foot and you hit through the line. Even though, technically speaking or traditionally speaking, you should be defending those deliveries. But because you, know, you have that skill set, that's number one. Secondly, the pitch is so good that you can trust the pace and the bounce of the pitch so you can hit through the line. 
So obviously we see a lot of, especially in modern day cricket and limited overs cricket, the pitches are so good and so batting friendly that you see a lot of the batters actually without reaching the pitch of the ball, they can drive on the up. That means the ball is still rising, you get on top of the bounce and you hit through the line. Trust the bounce, trust the pitch, not doing much, not in favor of the bowlers too much and you just hit through the line, on the rise or on the up. Down the track, well, it again is kind of self-explanatory. Down the track, so if this is the track, which the 22 yard or the pitch is, when you're down the track, so that could be for spinners, predominantly for spinners, or for seamers as well, because we keep talking about in, in the shortest format, the T20 100 or, or T10, we keep talking about crease management where you try and get the bowler off his length uh, by moving across or moving in front uh, or going down the track. So that is what it's all about, going down the track. As a batter, it's very, very important. Firstly, again, spin, because obviously you don't want the bowler to kind of settle down and especially that's such an aggressive and attacking option to a batter. A lot of the times, again, spin, you know, it can also be a, a kind of a shot to get singles. I've seen a lot of batters, they, the only time they go down the track is when they want to hit a big shot. But good players again spin, they also go down the track to get singles. The idea is to make sure the, bat, the bowler is aware that you will use your feet to come down the track and approach or get to the pitch of the ball. So what happens then? The spinner, as far as the spinner is concerned, he starts bowling flatter. The moment you start bowling flatter on generally decent pitches, it will not turn as much. It might not even bounce as much. It gets a little predictive and it's going to come nicely onto the bat if the bowler starts bowling flat, right? And also, the moment the bowler starts bowling flat, chances are his length will also get a little shorter. So you use you know, to use your feet to get to the pitch, also to get the bowler out of the length where he wants to bowl, right? So that's very important. Same with seamers as well. In T again, T10, 100, T T20, you've seen against good bowlers like, uh, let's say, a Hazel Bowl or a Jaspreet Bumrah or Mohamed Shami, who are good test ball bowlers who bowl that test length. You see a lot of batter using their feet not necessarily to hit an attacking shot, just trying to get these really good bowlers off their length. You don't want someone like Hazelwood to settle down there. So you've got to use your feet and do something. Just get that into Hazelwood or someone like him who's trying to settle down in an area that you're happy to use your feet and reach the pitch of the ball. The whole idea of going down the track is reaching the pitch of the ball. That's the predominant or the primary plan or idea, but not necessary all the time. At times you just do that to get the bowler thinking that you're happy to do it as well. You might not want to do it. For example, someone like me, I wasn't a very good player of coming down the track, but every now and then I would do it so that bowler knows that I can do it. Right? I don't necessarily have to do it. I was more of a back foot and a sweeper. Uh, as a guy who would uh, play a lot of sweep shot against the spinner and play off the back foot. But every now and then, I would make sure that I would do that. Go down the track. Just get the bowler thinking about it. Now, obviously, the question is, when do you come down the track? If it's not predetermined, which a lot of players do that, they're predetermined, you've kind of figured out, or you're trying to get a quick bowler or a bowler off his line and length, so you predetermine going down the track. But to be a good batter who uses his or her feet well, I think the most important part, and you've heard this before, is any ball which goes above your eye line. So now you see a lot of batters who go down like that before the bowlers bowl, right? They just dip their shoulder. So the lower you go, I won't say lower, if you go a little lower, so you've one, figure out the length better, and secondly, anything which is above that eye line. So if you have, if that's my eye line, anything which is above that eye line, I would step out. Chances are it would be fuller, and chances are you would reach the pitch of the ball. So that's, again, a very basic thing or, the, or kind of the starting point is the eye line. So if you are batting in the nets, try this. Go there, 
dip that shoulder, go down a bit, get into that position, and then anything which is above that eye line, and obviously you're wearing a helmet, the other thing, the eye line or your helmet, so the peak of the helmet. So anything which goes, any ball which goes above that peak of your helmet, try and step out, try and reach the pitch of the ball, go down the track, that's one thing. The other thing, which is next level, is which foot comes first? Is it the front foot or is it the back foot? Now, this is interesting. So there are different versions of it, and how I see it is, what area are you trying to access by stepping out? If you're trying to access cover, extra cover, mid-off, and you're trying to step out you know, to a leg spinner, okay, or a left arm spinner, anyone who's taking the ball away from you, you don't mind actually stepping out a smaller step with your front foot, and then the back foot going behind the front foot, so you get into that position to go over the cover, extra cover. So you're, you're automatically, your front shoulder closes, right? So you take that small foot forward and then the front foot goes behind. So look at my shoulder, it's already closed, right? And I'm in a really good position to hit over cover, extra cover. But if it's predominantly, you know, trying to hit over the leg side, so it's easier. So you, you actually, you step out with a lot more, with your body being a lot more open, right? So ideally, you know, this would be a normal position to step out. But if you want to actually go cover, extra cover, it'll be nice if you kind of close your shoulders a little bit earlier uh, while stepping out itself. It'll help you keep that shape going for longer, especially if you want to access over covers or extra cover. So Cricket Last Stories with me, Neil Kagram. Again on the channel, delighted to be joined by former Indian international Deep Dasgupta. Deep, how's it all going? All good, brilliant actually. Uh, yeah, finally uh, after the World Cup, getting to spend some time at home. <laughs> yeah, um, cold UK. So that's, uh, <laughs> as another topic. Not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this video is all going to be about dealing with pressure and nerves as a batter. Mm -hmm. What would you say to a young player? Yeah. Feeling that emotion, the pressure. Yeah. Perhaps the biggest one is pressure of getting out on, on a game day. Yeah, I think that's very, very important. And to be honest, it's all about pressure. I think, I mean, how many times have you heard the higher you go, it becomes a mental sport. It's not physical anymore. And that's so true. I mean, having been there and played a few games for international games, I can tell you it, it boils down to how you handle things like pressure, success, failure, and all of that stuff. And it's all up in the mind. Uh, and it's important to start training your mind from a very early age. It doesn't happen if you think you're just magically going to start learn uh, to handle pressure and success and all the stuff uh, while you're playing at that level, it doesn't happen. So you've got to start training yourself little by little from a very early age. And when we're talking about pressure, it's not just about cricket, it's about any sport, it's about life itself. You know, pressure of expectation, pressure of obviously failure and success and all of that. So I think it's just just part of I think everyone's life, and uh, yeah, and 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 for example, and this is what I would suggest is break down whatever. Let's say because we're talking about cricket here, break down your how you see success or failure. You know, a lot of us we see success and failure based on absolute numbers. So you haven't got a hundred, oh that was a failure. You haven't picked up five wickets, it's a failure. So if we kind of isolate uh, the process of getting to, let's say, 200 or 100, or the process of getting five wickets, I think if we can kind of focus on that and not the end result, uh, I think you kind of prepare yourself better that way. Because as we know, at times, we don't have control over the end product, right? You might be batting very well, but maybe a poor decision or your one mistake can cost you your wicket and you're suddenly out, even though you know you're hitting the ball well, you know you're batting well. Same with bowling. You might get a five-wicket haul bowling absolute crap, full tosses, right, and half volleys, but you might end up getting five wickets. But there'll be days when you've absolutely bowled chaffers, but you've only picked one or maybe none at all. So I think it's very, very important to kind of understand and, and separate the process and the end result. And in batting, we all know it can be over in a fraction of a second. As you said, you could be hitting it like oh, a yeah. dream. 
but then it could, and then you can be back in the pavilion. Yeah. The importance of focusing on the very next ball. Yes. And that's, again, that's something uh, we keep talking about, as in stay in the present, but that's something, again, we, we can practice, you know, in net sessions and, you know, while you're practicing, is, is obviously having your own processes of what we call stepping up and stepping down in concentration, because obviously it's quite impossible to concentrate over seven hours. So you have, at the most, when we talk about concentrating, we're talking about 100%, in absolute 100% focus. So that's very little that you can do because it can be very, very mentally taxing and you know, it can get exhausted very, very soon. So for that, I guess, when you're in the nets, you find your own processes. For example, I would, um, you know, as soon as I would play the ball, I would look at something else which has got nothing to do with the bowler or the match or the opposition. Uh, if I'm playing, if I'm playing at a venue, I would look at the tallest place around that ground and imagine what the view would be from there. So obviously my home ground, Eden Gardens, so there is this, if, I mean, it, if, if you notice, there is this uh, football tank. There's a water tank in the shape of a football and you can see it from the ground. And, at times, I would imagine myself sitting there and what the view would be like of the Ganges, the Howrah Bridge and stuff like that, or sit on top of one of those floodlights. Um, and then, obviously, that is stepping down. Now, it is also important to step right back into that focus, area of focus, 100% focus. Then you have your processes. For example, a lot of players you'd see, you know, they're very fidgety with their pads or their helmets or something. That's nothing but getting your mind and your body ready for the next ball and getting yourself into the present or what's going to happen uh, in, in a bit. So, they, and you have, you know, a lot of players, they scratch their marks as in their batting marks again and stuff like that or tap on the bat or go down the pitch and stuff like that. So everyone has their own process and, and, and I would kind of suggest that you know you guys out there uh, find your own process what works for you where you can step down take your mind off the game uh, and then again make sure you're back at the job again uh, when the bowl is ready and then how important is it to almost not get lost in the actual battle with the bowler in terms of you hear a lot about yeah. sledging etc a yeah. bowler trying to throw you off your game yeah. intimidating stares, etc. Is it does it all go back into that that yeah. realm of focusing on the next ball? Yeah, absolutely yes. So if you're in that kind of process or in that mindset where you've taken your mind away from the game, because if you think about it, while you're actually playing the sport with the cricket, it's basically half a second, maybe one second. But it's the time between the two deliveries and two overs where you have a good 30 odd second or a minute, minute and a half in case of, you know, between overs. That's where you have the time to think. And the important part for me is how do you manage those 30 seconds between two deliveries? Because obviously you've got monkeys sitting in your, on your shoulder in your head. That monkey could be saying positive things or that monkey could be saying negative things. So the the, uh, the, the, the conversations you have between those deliveries internally is very, very important. And that's where I think, when you're talking about sledging and all, if those, those things with the opposition are saying, be staring or whatever, or doing, if that gets you in that mind space, for example, I think Virat is a great example, he loves it, right? He wants it, so he gets into that space when somebody's saying something. And there are, um, for example, Brian Lara, someone I played against, he actually absolutely loved talking to the opposition. The more you talk to him, the more focused he would get. But obviously there are others who doesn't like it. And it depends on individuals. Predominantly, more often than not, players don't like it. And for that, and if, if you don't like it, I think it's, it's important for you to, to do two things. One is stay in the present, get your mind off it, look at something or do whatever, whatever works for you. Secondly, also try and understand how important your wicket is for the opposition. Right? If it wasn't important, the opposition won't be doing all that, if it was that easy. So you obviously you're important enough for the opposition to do something else apart from just bowling. Now when it comes to almost adapting in the middle, technique, guard, etc., how yeah. important is it that then almost for it not to affect you 
mentally when we're talking about on that topic of batting mindset, etc. Yeah. Uh, so obviously you've got to be proactive as well. For example, because nobody's 100% perfect with their technique, you always keep changing it, not changing it, but you kind of fine tune it depending on the bowler, depending on the conditions. For example, it's, if it's a bouncy pitch, so, and it's a quick pitch, you want to make sure that you, know, you don't have a very high back lift, you don't want to be late on it, so you kind of manage the back lift. You want to keep it shorter, and, you know, so you can get the bat down quicker. You know, things like that. So if, if there is, for example, if a bowler, if the ball's swinging around a lot and you have a bowler like a Sean Pollock or a Makra, you don't know which one's coming in, which one's leaving. So you kind of play inside the line. Right? So things like that. So you've got to manipulate, for example, like you said, if there's an off spinner who's not turning the ball and he's predominantly bowling straighter ones, so you rather than standing on a middle stump or leg stump, you might want to stand on the off stump. I, you know, things like that. So I think you've got to be, you've got to be thinking uh, and be proactive and not let anything else affect you. You've got to read, the, read and assess this condition, situation and the bowler and everything else. And then, and please, I mean, there's something that I keep seeing a lot of kids and coaches trying to make sure that the technique is perfect. There is nothing called perfect technique, nothing. Our bodies are different, biomechanically we are different, our bat swings will be different. We try and get to what is biomechanically could be the perfect thing, but obviously nobody's perfect. So you, we all we all trying to kind of handle those deficiencies or weaknesses and the guys who do it the best, guys who succeed. You talk about assessing conditions for a young player going out to the middle just in the event that he's maybe like overthinking a lot of things, what, yeah. what would you say is that the most important things they should yeah. be focusing on when uh, they go out to the middle? I, I think the most important thing, I think, uh, and this is from personal experience as well, when I'm really, really prepared, I think less on the field. Right? It's when I'm not prepared is that's when I'm thinking. So if I've covered all my bases and prepared myself really well before a game, and that's not just about physically but mentally, uh, for instance, who am I going to play in the opposition, the bowlers, what they do, what their strengths are, uh, their actions, if I haven't seen them before, and now obviously there are videos and you can find videos of the oppositions or whatever, just watch their action, if somebody has a little different action, a little unorthodox, you're ready for it, the different variations that the bowler has, the pitch, how the pitch is going to play and what's your game plan. So if you've covered all your bases, then you've got to trust yourself because you have a plan then. You worked it out and you have a plan. And then I think automatically you think less. But obviously there'll be nerves. And let me tell you this, Neil, being nervous is good. It's, it's a positive thing. I know a lot of people when we say nervous, they, it, it has a negative ring to it or think about it, but it's not. So. You're nervous is because you care enough, and that is a good thing. So it is all, it's natural and a good thing to be nervous, but again, it's the first few deliveries. So go down to the basics, basics in the sense, focus on things which are in your control, as we keep talking about, control the controllables, which could be, you know, everyone has one thing that you can focus on at the most too. So you can focus on your head, making sure your head's straight, or as a bowler, making sure your left arm is, you're running in nice and easy, and. And the best thing, actually, the best thing ever is breathing. So you have a normal breathing pattern. And you will figure out if you're breathing heavy, that means obviously you're nervous. And you will. So try and get your breathing, you know, rate down to your normal level or focus on your breathing. You know, breathing in, in, there in, breathing out or whatever. And, and that help you stay in the moment. I think that's... The, the kind of easiest way to stay in the moment is just focus on breathing. Yeah, some amazing tips there. Yeah. A lot of this you teach and more at your academy. Yeah. In the, yeah. In the UK, do you want to just say a little bit? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I uh, always wanted to get into coaching, which uh, I have now. I have my media commitments, but apart from that, I started the Super Kings Academy here in Baksha, that is in collaboration with, uh, with the Super Kings of Chennai. Uh, this is their first academy uh, outside India. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been quite interesting. It's been on for a while. 
um, and the idea is to kind of help and pass on as much as I can or what I know. Uh, obviously, we've got coaches. We're getting, uh, we, you know, the starting next term, we're getting a coach exclusively for the academy. Uh, obviously, we've got our own space now, almost on the renting of this, but we've got our own space which has a gym, a couple of indoor facilities, the outdoor and pitches and box nets and everything. So, yeah, very happy about it. And, and it's just amazing to see talent and young kids coming and playing cricket. Uh, nothing can be that. So, and, and yeah, I mean, I've always been passionate about coaching. So, it's, it's, I'm so happy to kind of be part of the, the coaching process. And for those that want to find out a bit more, you've got a website. We'll put everything yeah. in the description of this video. But yeah, you have a website, etc. Yeah, we've got a website. Um, uh, we've got a phone number as well, and, and it'll be there on the screen. Uh, so yeah, if, if any one of you know, I mean, any one of you interested, we're in Berkshire, which is not too far from, let's say, London, and you know, uh, it's driving distance. As of now, we've got one venue, but. Uh, you know, touch wood, keeping fingers crossed by maybe a month or so, we might have a few more venues. Uh, so yeah, so if you're interested, just drop in a message, uh, send in a mail, give us a call. Yeah, more than happy. Exciting times ahead. Deep, perfect. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. So Cricket Last Stories with me, Neil Kagram. Today on the channel, again, we're joined by former Indian international, Deep Dasgupta. Deep, how's it going? Ah, oh, not too bad. All good, all good. So Deep, on this one, we're going to talk about the mindset side of batting. And for a young player, perhaps, does it all start at practice? Definitely, yes. I mean, that's where we keep talking about being mentally strong. And I guess somewhere, and, and in a major way as well, that is connected with confidence. And that comes with how well you're practicing, how much you're practicing, because if you've, it's, it's like any other field, isn't it? If you're prepared enough, automatically that confidence comes and you, you know, you're stronger mentally because you know you've done the the hard work, you've 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 done the hard miles, so you know exactly that, you know, you're good enough. How do you ensure that a player doesn't overthink their game, uh, almost get their mind scrambled in between that game and practice period? Uh, that's a very tricky one because obviously I've seen and come across a lot of players who are a little more technically bent, so they would kind of analyse everything, every movement, every innings, uh, which is not a bad idea, but you know there is a very fine line being analysing something and over-analysing it and getting stuck because it can be a kind of a quicksand if you can't draw the line and if, if, you, if that line is very blurry. So it's very important that you know, you have your basics right. So what I would suggest is have a few, you know, check boxes, uh, keeping it very, very simple for batting, bowling, wicket keeping, and just just look at those things and, and not worry about too many things because what happens is it's, you know, you kind of, there are symptoms. You've got to figure out the root cause to, and, and diagnose those symptoms correctly. Because what happens more often than not, and it's not just about individual players, but at times coaches as well. As coaches, we diagnose the symptoms and not the root cause. So bottom line, I guess, try and keep it simple, important to analyze, but just keep it as simple as possible. Are you almost saying that a player should see their game more as a process, as opposed to looking at the individual scores, whether ah, it be, even yeah. if they get a century on the Saturday or a, or, a, or a low score? Yes, I mean, one thing I'm sure you've heard and, and everyone else has heard about as well is, is, is being emotionally balanced and, and not be in an emotional roller coaster where you're doing well, you're like top of the world, you know, you can't be a better cricketer, but then if you're not doing well, then, you know, you're sitting in a corner of your room and not getting out of your room. So, so one of the major things to kind of avoid that is, like you said, everything, let it be process-based. So then, even though you've got a hundred, you've got to analyze and figure out whether you're batting well or not, because there are very good chances, and anyone who's played decent amount of cricket and, you know, uh, for a few years, they'll figure out there are days when you're batting like a dream, but you get out scoring 20. And there are days when you're not feeling well, you, you know you're not batting well, but you end up getting 100. So, uh, so the end result can't be, you know, uh, end of it all. It has to be the process. And, and like you said, just think about the process. Were you bowling right? Was the hand, ball coming out of your hand correctly? I mean, did you play the shots that you wanted to? Did you kind of hit areas that you wanted to? 
Yeah. You've obviously shared a dressing room with some of the greats of our game. Was that a common trait that you saw in that dressing room, that kind of mindset? Yeah. yeah I, seeing it as a process? Uh, absolutely, yes, because, you know, uh, we've all got to realise that we are in the business of failure here, right? I mean, the best players, name the best players in the world, their success rate would be one in three, which is 33%, which is not a lot. I mean, you, you, you'll fail in, in, in any exam with that, with, with that kind of a success rate, but we are in that business. So it, more than handling the 33%, it is how you handle the 66%. And for mere mortals like us, <laughs> that could be 80% of the times. What about dealing with nerves? whether it be before the game, hmm. you're just about to walk out, yeah. your next man in, or even in the middle, maybe yeah. you're a tail ender and facing a quick bowler, you have that nerve element. Yeah. Any tips for a young player uh, that's watching this? I, I think the important part is to have a routine and prepare yourself. Bottom line is preparation. So, and, and this is what I, what, what I keep telling people and telling kids is it's important to prepare during a net session, what you expect to get in a match. For example, a lot of us, we hit the nets and without a plan, we just go rock up and hit a few balls or bowl, that's about it, without a plan. It's important to have a plan and have specific, spe specific plans for, for every net session or every session that you have uh, and, and make sure you, you fulfill those because that's how you prepare yourself for the tough times. You can't, you, you can't be rock, rocking up in net sessions and just not worrying about it and into a game, suddenly you're 40 for four batting and because you don't know how to handle that situation. So when you're batting in the nets, make sure you, you kind of simulate those situations and, uh, uh, and, and tell yourself before a net session, you know what, I'm going to bat as if it's 40 for four and, and bat accordingly. You mentioned the word routine there. In yeah. the middle, is it important to have individual things that help you keep fresh mentally switching on and off between balls etc yeah oh, obviously you've got yeah. to you've got to test 100 yourself so, that ability to go big yeah any tips again uh, i mean routine is imperative i mean you've got to have a routine i got to have a plan and when i say routine because it's in the biggest challenge that i think in in cricket is especially as a batter because batting is is reactionary right you 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 react to the ball. You see a ball and you play it. So you see a ball, your muscle memory takes over and you do what you do. But the biggest challenge is what you do between two deliveries. So you've got good 10, 15 seconds or maybe even more between deliveries. And what you think, how you manage those 15, 20 seconds is very, very important because that's the mindset you get into while you get into your stance to react to a bowler. And it happens to every player, whether you're the best player in the world or a young clubby, that dip in form, the feeling you can't even yeah. get it off, off the square. Yeah. When you're going through a slump like that as a player, what kind of things, when you reflect back on the career you've had, mm. playing at the highest level, test cricket for India, yeah. what kind of things were you doing, were the greats doing around you in terms yeah. of getting yourself back into form, getting that mindset yeah. correct? I think the bottom line is self-confidence to a great extent and self-belief, uh, belief that, you know, everything f is kind of temporary, whether it's good form or bad form, even if you are having a great year, I mean, you want to prolong it, but you also know if you play long enough, you'll have these, these periods where, you know, you can do no wrong and there are these periods where you can do no right. So you've, you've got to learn, obviously, that comes with experience and having the right people around you to guide you through those uh, periods. Uh, but again, the, the processes are important. Obviously, there would be reasons. It, and those are the times when you, when, you know, when the things are going well, you don't analyze as much. But the problem is we tend to overanalyze when things aren't going your way. And that's the reason I keep saying have those check boxes. Uh, uh, and, and, and see whether you're having a good day or a bad day, things that you really need to focus on, and most of those boxes would be process-based. And then when you're in form, it's all about cashing in, when you're in the zone oh, and yeah. going big? Oh yeah, because like I said, I mean, we are in, in, in the business of failure, so make sure one in four, one in five, that one is worth the other four failures or five failures that you would have, which you will have, let's face it. I mean you will have more failures than successes. So make sure those successes are big enough
to kind of overshadow all, uh, all, all, uh, all the failures. And just to end on, what is your best tip for a, for a young player perhaps watching this on the subject of mindset? Uh, on subject of mindset, I, okay, plan. I think planning is important uh, because this is something that I've seen and, and something that I've done myself as well. Uh, in my career, just going for a practice session or a net session, not having a plan, not really knowing what, I've, what I want to do, what I want to achieve with the two hours or three hours that I'm going to put in. Uh, so it's important to kind of maintain a diary maybe, uh, maintain a journal, uh, putting down, jotting down what you want to achieve. It's, it's not going to take more than 10 minutes. Just jot down things that you want to achieve out of a session. And then again, put in another 10 hours after, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, 10 minutes after that and just going through it, whether you've achieved it or not and where did you go wrong if you haven't. So, yeah, and, and just try and, because that will teach you a lot about yourself, your game, your mind. So, yeah, just try and keep a journal, that's it. Deep, perfect. Thank you. Pleasure.